Well, good morning, church. It is wonderful to be with you on this gorgeous Sunday morning. Um, we recognize that today is Mother's Day and just want to say Happy Mother's Day to those of you um, who this day is a day of celebration. It is a day of um, honoring people in your life that have brought you up and made a difference in, um, in everything for you, really. And we just want to celebrate with those who this morning, this is a time of celebration, but we also want to recognize that Mother's Day is also a really hard day for many people, whether um, you don't have good memories with the mother figure that was in your life, or maybe you have lost uh, a mother figure in your life this last year, and this, this morning brings pain, and we just want to um, lift up the fact that we rejoice with those who are rejoicing, but we also mourn with those who mourn, and we just recognize that, that a day like this has a whole range of complexity of emotions and we just want to, to, to know that we are praying with you and we are, we are with you wherever you fall and experience this day today. If you're guests with us, we are glad that you're here. Um, if we were in the sanctuary for regular uh, embodied worship, there would be little green connection cards in the backs of all of your pews that we would invite you to, to grab one of those, fill it out, and then drop it in the offering basket a little bit later in the service. But obviously, since we don't pass offering plates in this season and we're not embodied in the sanctuary, there are no green connection cards in front of you. But we have put together a Google form, or I don't think it's a Google form, but it's an online form that you can fill out, and we just really, really want to know that you were here. Uh, it's so helpful for our staff, for our pastoral care team to be aware of who, um, who is logging in, who's participating in the worship gathering. So if you'd be willing to fill out that form, it would mean the world to us. And if you're a guest with us, we really want to know that you're here. And we want to have a chance just to say thank you for being with us in worship. So please take a minute. It takes, I think, less than a minute just to fill it out real fast um, and let us know that you were here this morning uh, so that we can reach out and say thank you. And if you're one of our members or regular attenders, we want to know that you're here so that we can um, keep a read on everybody and see how folks are doing in this uh, really wild and unprecedented time. With that, I'm going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to enter into a time of worship through song. So friends, if you would, please pray with me. Good. And gracious God, perfect creator, parent, father, mother, God, we come before you on this morning and we once again, from wherever we may find ourselves on this planet, on the, on the spread of the Atlanta uh, cityscape, in the state of Georgia, God, wherever we might be, we pray that your spirit would open us up to your presence. Because, God, we need the inbreaking of your presence in our lives afresh. These weeks that we're experiencing are long and they are hard and they are leaving so many of us with confusion and uncertainty. And, God, on this morning, to add to, to everything, God, the reminder, the painful, the, the dark reminder that justice is not for everyone in this country, God in our own home state. We mourn, God, with those who are mourning on this day, mothers who have lost their sons, people who are truly experiencing injustice in the land of the free. So God, meet us. Whether we're in a good place today and we are here to rejoice, whether we are in a sorrowful place and we are here to mourn, whether we are someplace in the middle, God, we just pray that you would open us up to receive from you what it is that we need. May none of us leave this time together unchanged, unmoved. All of this we pray in the name of the Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, siblings in Christ, I invite you now to join us in a call to worship. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to God our Maker in the good times and in the bad. God, we pray that you would fill us this morning, empower us to to be strengthened and transformed as the body of Christ scattered across this world. 
So friends, I now invite you, wherever you may find yourselves, to join your voices or your spirit in songs of prayer, of love, of devotion to our good, loving, and infinitely caring creator, God. today comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 31. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. 
come quickly to my rescue, be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. God, our Father, give us daily bread. Blessing our hands and covering our heads. God, our mother, leading us into peace, drawing and comforting all those who New Testament reading today comes from the book of 1 Peter. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a 
have chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Well, again, good morning, friends. And as I said at the outset, if you missed the opening, happy Mother's Day to those for whom this morning is a, and day is a day of celebration. We rejoice with you. And we also recognize that this day is a day that represents loss and pain for many people. And we mourn with you. The Christian community is tasked to journey with one another through the, through the array of life's emotions, and we are called, because we all experience the array of life's emotions at different times, we are called to be there with one another in the midst of that experience, and we here at Eastside seek to do that as well. If you're a guest with us again, welcome. We are so happy that you have chosen to log in and to participate with our digital worship experience in this season of the pandemic, and we look forward to hopefully someday in the future having an opportunity to meet you in person in our beautiful sanctuary at 468 Moreland Avenue in East Atlanta. And if you are a guest with us, it might be helpful for you to know that here at Eastside, we have been in something of an extended preaching journey. At the turn of the new year in 2020, we entered into a series we've titled Rooted and Grounded. And the first part of that journey, we spent time looking at that re- metaphor of rootedness. What does it look like for us to tend to our souls in, in the way that we tend to a garden or a plant, the way a tree grows and bears fruit? Our our own spiritual dimension has the capacity to grow and to expand in our lives and to become a greater and greater influence on and in who we are and the way we are in the world, rooted. And then we moved to grounded at the beginning of Lent and moved from the individual's individual's growth and, and spiritual experience to that of the collective, to the group. What does it look like to explore the architecture of human communities, specifically human communities seeking to collectively follow in the way of the Christ? And the way that we've been getting at this is by looking at many of the ancient church communities to whom uh, different documents in the New Testament were addressed. We began by looking at Jesus and his, his band of disciples, the first sort of society of Jesus followers, if you will. And we moved from there and we looked at the, the church in Jerusalem after Pentecost. We looked at the church in Rome and in Corinth and in Philippi and Colossae and Thessalonica and... This morning we come to kind of an interesting, um, an interesting one. We come to, come to John, and John wrote one of the four Gospels, and there are three letters after that that are also um, attested to John's authorship, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we're going to talk more about this after the reading, but um, there was a lot of options in terms of what scripture to kind of open up with, but I decided to go with... Um, a really profound text that we're actually going to come back to really more towards the very end of the message just to sort of set expectations. But as I read, we're going to be reading from the first letter from John, chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 7. As I read, I invite you, friends, to listen for the word of God. John writes, Beloved, Our New Testament reading. Let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. 
In this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, because God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and is, his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent the son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. Those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And those who say, I love God, while simultaneously hating their brothers or their sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their siblings also. Friends, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal one, God who was, God who shall be on the other side of all of the pandemonium that is happening in our world right now, will you please break into our present in these moments? As this service unfolds, God, meet us. Open our hearts, open our ears to hear from you. And I pray, God, that these words that I have prepared might be your word for your people in this time, God, and that you would indeed speak through them and as and where necessary speak in spite of me. God, may the words of my mouth and the collective meditations of all of our hearts spread across this globe in this time indeed be found good, right, pleasing, and acceptable in your sight. God, our rock, God, our redeemer, God, our hope, God, our savior. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone typed, amen. Today, friends, we come to what biblical scholarship refers to as the Johannine community. Because as you read through John's gospel, and then as you read through his three epistles, his three letters, first, second, and third, John, you quickly realize that this author, he has a way about him. He has kind of a unique style of communicating, and it's quite unique within the New Testament. If you were going to have one of those little quizzes from when you're a kid, you know, which thing doesn't fit, or which one feels a little bit different, John would probably be the one that you would choose. We have four gospel accounts in our Bibles of Jesus' life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and three of those gospels are known as the synoptics. And the word synoptic simply means of or forming a general summary or synopsis. And this seems to be what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are are, are seeking to do. And and of course, each of the three synoptics have their own things that they highlight, their own important theological themes that they want to draw out of Christ's life. They are different, but they're all kind of, from a genre perspective, similar in that they're all synopsises of Jesus' life. But then we come to John, and we quickly realize that we have almost been thrown into an alternate universe, especially if you read one of the synoptics first and then go straight into John, you'll immediately recognize that there's a very different approach and a very different aim taking place in this gospel. It's very different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as is the case with all of our New Testament writings, scholars, they come to these texts, texts and they ask these, honestly, really basic sorts of questions. They ask questions like, who wrote this? 
To whom were they writing? What was the occasion? Why were they writing to them? Why go the route of the painstaking work in the first century of procuring papyrus and ink and a quill and then spending painstaking time writing a document as long as John's gospel. For us, it's 21 chapters in the ancient world. This is a lot of writing. And you have to remember, no word processors, and I'm doubting that they had whiteout back then. It was a big deal to write a document like John's gospel. So many scholars believe that the reason John's gospel is so dramatically different and his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, are so different, but they also carry much of the same themes and symbolism of the gospel is that it's very likely the case that John is writing to a particular church community in the ancient world, a community that scholars refer to as this Johannine church. Now, like I said in the introduction, we are going to get to the text that we read, but we have to do a little bit of work in the Gospels before we get there to set this up. And some of you may remember from our most recent Christmas Eve service, um, the liturgy that we experienced together at the beginning of the services was taken from what's called John's Prologue, the, the first section from the first chapter of John's Gospel. And it begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, notice immediately from the outset of the beginning of John's gospel, he doesn't begin with a super crazy long genealogy like Matthew does. He doesn't begin with a pregnancy narrative that leads to a birth narrative, as in Luke. And he certainly doesn't do what the gospel of Mark does, which is pretty much just cut out everything before Jesus' public ministry and just dive right in with Jesus and John the Baptist. No, what does John do? He goes, he goes way back, back before there was a back to go before. John is unique in that he begins the story before the story even starts, before creation has even taken place. And John has a reason for doing this. You have to remember There were all sorts of ideas floating around in the ancient world. First off, there were just basic ideas about who and what would Israel's Messiah be like, look like, sound like. But then after the Christ event, then there was a whole plethora of ideas about who Jesus was, who the Christ was who the Christ is. And some in the earliest centuries of Christianity, they wanted to make the claim or the argument that Because of Jesus' exceptional humanness, essentially God made a choice to then adopt Jesus as God's son after he had lived this this sort of magnificent life. And God chose then to, to use Jesus to bring about salvation through God's adopted son. The early church had issue with this, as does John. And others wanted to say that The Christ was far too good and wonderful and majestic and powerful to have actually been a real human at all, to have been embodied in one of these, you know, human bodies. The Christ was far too amazing to have been like me or to be like you. Jesus must have simply appeared to have been in a physical body, but in actuality, he was in the the incorruptible stuff of spirit. He was simply disguised as physicality. Another huge idea that was floating around in the ancient world about the Christ that the early church said no to, as does John. The early Christian movement, they they, they rejected both of these notions and, and... Another time, maybe, we can go in depth into why that is, into some of the the, the layers of of that that, that whole conversation. But what's important for, for our purposes this morning is that at the time of John's writing, both of these ideas were most likely in the water that the Johannine church were drinking from. John is aware that these ideas were probably floating around, impacting, influencing the Johannine community which is probably why John, from the outset of his gospel, begins by simply shutting down the idea of adoptionism. He places the eternal word within the creator God before the foundation of the world. 
the, the, the Christ has been preexistent before there was even a creation. The Christ has always been with God, in God, a part of the Godhead. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. And then Paul, what does he do? Ne- not Paul, excuse me, John, what does he do next? But he, he pushes against the other, the other extreme that was floating around in that day. And he says, what? The Word became sarks. The Word became flesh. The preexistent Word of God does not remain spirit on earth, but the preexistent Word of God takes on a body, becomes a human like you, like me, flesh, blood, bone, mind, matter. There's no, there's no trickery going on. There's not a spirit pretending to be flesh. No, John says preexistent Word of God with God at the beginning and took on a real body. That's how John starts his gospel. You have to remember, friends, these conversations, they're not even on the radar of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Go back and read them. And this is why many scholars believe that John was most likely written substantially later than the first three gospels. When Matthew, Mark, and Luke were writing, a lot of these, these debates may not have even been taking place in the form that they were in which John was responding But John, he is responding to a particular theological context and probably to a particular church community and what they were wrestling with in their time and in their reality. Now, as you read John's gospel, and if you've never read through John's gospel, I know it's long, but this is a great season. There's a bunch of Bible apps, and you can put in your earbuds. And if you're lucky, you have noise-canceling headphones if you have kids at home, so you can totally shut them out. And you can listen to somebody else read the Gospel of John to you while you wash dishes or look over your kid's shoulder and make sure they're doing their digital learning. But I would encourage you to read it. And if you read it, you're going to notice something really quickly, especially if you read large portions of it at once. Over and over and over again, Jesus in John's Gospel makes this point that he exists in a constant, radical communion with God his Father. Over and over again, John describes Jesus, his life, as having this radical intimacy, almost walking side by side in stride with his father, with whom Jesus is referring to Israel's God, Yahweh. It would be an interesting study to see how many times the Greek word meno gets used throughout John's gospel, because meno is the word that in English we translate abide. And in 1 John, the text that we read this morning, abide, 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 over and over and over again. John uses this word of Jesus constantly and of Jesus' followers. John's gospel, it is the gospel of abiding. Abiding with the Father, abiding with God to remain close, intimately connected. There's almost this, this sense that Jesus and the Father, they, they like dwell within one another's being. Jesus, he has this remarkable connection. He's, he's, he's rooted, he is grounded in the presence of the divine. Jesus says that he abides in the Father and that the Father abides in him. He speaks of this radical closeness, this nearness, this connectedness, this presence, this, this almost mystical intermingling of heaven and earth in his life and his experience with God. The Gospel of John, over and over and over again, speaks to this beautiful intimacy that the Christ has with the Creator. And some of you maybe have experienced that level of intimacy with another human being, you know, where you can basically know exactly what the other person is thinking when something takes place, maybe a partner or a really close friend. You can kind of crawl inside of one another's heads and hearts. Or someone says a certain thing and you, you, you wince, not because of how it affects you, but the way you know that it affected that other person when they heard that, right? Some of us have had intimate relationships where we are almost inside of the mind and the heart of another human. Communion so close, so deep, so robust that you can 
practically feel what they're feeling in those times. That is the level of relationship that Jesus describes with the Father in John. John highlights this spiritual closeness, this intimacy. In John's gospel, Jesus even goes so far as to say in chapter 10, verse 30, that I and the Father are one. Which is a really big deal. And in John's gospel, this is what begins to get Jesus in trouble with the religious authorities. Because they interpreted that as Jesus claiming to be divine himself. Which was in first century Judaism, a a charge of blaspheme. No human was allowed to claim equality with Israel's God. The narrative starts to shift when Jesus makes this claim of intimacy. Statements like that of chapter 14, verse 11. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. They illustrate how John is trying to show his community the way in which Jesus lived in this radical relationship of intimacy with God. And scholars, they, they argue that the Johannine community was indeed this community of people who were pretty radical in their patterning of, 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 of discipleship after the way of Jesus revealed in John's gospel. They took it pretty literally, apparently. Apparently they were a community who scholars believe had this overwhelming, radical sense of intimacy horizontally with one another and vertically with God. They were a community who intentionally embraced this this profound sense of intimacy and closeness with their fellow Christian siblings and with the divine. Scholars argue that John's community to which he is writing was was probably this really, really tight-knit group of believers, these people who were just, they were, they were interwoven into the fabric of one another's lives. They, they were fully present with one another in a way that was rare and beautiful. People who took seriously this claim of radical intimacy But we haven't even got to the revolutionary part yet of John's gospel. Because when you get to chapter 15, something crazy happens. And I preached on chapter 15, the first part of it back in February, in the organic part of our series, of the rooted part. But I want to read to you what comes after the metaphor of Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. Beginning in verse 12, chapter 15, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now listen to this. This is the rabbi speaking to the disciples. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. Do you see what just happened here? The gravity of what just took place in these verses. Jesus the rabbi just flipped the entire script on his own students, on his own disciple. The rabbi, the authority, the teacher, he just graduated his disciples from the place of pupil, to this new state of equality, to a state of collaborative friendship with the Messiah. Jesus reveals to his disciples this rubric of relationship between himself and the Father, and then he flips it, and now he's extending it to his own disciples, making them friends, shifting the power dynamic. John's gospel is the gospel in which Jesus is remembered to have washed the feet of his own disciples as opposed to making them wash his feet. There's this intimate give and take relationship and Jesus now says to them, you are my disciples, now you're my friends. And the true love of real friendship, according to the Christ, is a willingness to sacrifice your own life for the sake of your friends. I mean, the whole scene, it's really, it's really quite astounding. It's, it's, it's actually pretty convicting. 
I mean, it makes me ask myself, am I a good friend? I mean, maybe ask, makes you ask yourself, are you a good friend? Do our friendships have this sort of Christ-like love saturating them? It occurred to me as I was reflecting on this text, if I ask two friends, who's in charge of the relationship? You'll probably learn a whole lot really quickly by how they respond. And because we intuitively know, right, that the answer should be no one's in charge of a friendship, right? It kind of rubs against the very idea. We intuit the fact that in a healthy friendship, no one is in charge, but more like a good marriage partnership. It's co-laboring. It's, it's, it's this balanced effort of energy, of intention, of intimacy, of brother, of sisterly, of siblingly love. In John's gospel, the very idea of friendship, it not only gets affirmed, but it's shown to be where the disciples of Jesus ought to be heading. In John's gospel, mature disciples sort of graduate from simply being at the state of pupil with rabbi, and then they're elevated to become a collaborator and a co-creator in the kingdom and with the kingdom of God on this planet. Friendship, friends, with the rabbi. That, that's, that's a new dynamic. That, that's, that changes everything. This is, this is a whole new way of being Christian. A story came to mind, or an experience I had came to mind when I graduated from seminary. I was still calling all my professors doctor, what, you know, doctor this, doctor that. And they started to stop me and they said, you, you graduated, dude. Like, I, my name is, you know, Karen, um, Ian. And I was, you know, it was really weird. Weirdest thing ever, actually, to go from calling them doctor to their first names. But they insisted, and it's really humbling because I'm not a doctor. So why do I get to call them by their first name? But, but the same is still true of Jesus with his disciples who are now his friends. They're not the Christ, but they've been placed. They've been elevated to a place of friendship. They are now co-creators in the mission of Christ, of God, and the world. So I'll make the argument that the Gospel of John sanctifies. It makes holy the idea of human, of Christian friendship. Friendship, it becomes something sacred in John's rendering of Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus graduates his own disciples, his students, to this new place of intimacy, of relationship, no longer one of hierarchy or authority, but one of co-laboring. Human intimacy within the Christian church. John's showing us that it's of great value and it's really important. It's illustrated for us by Jesus' own life in John's gospel. Friendship, it is a holy calling. And I don't know why we don't talk more about friendship in the church. It's interesting. Maybe it's indicative of the world in which we live, but we are called and we are required It is a gospel mandate to participate in Christian friendship with our siblings in Christ if we want to experience the fullness of a divinely soaked life. Christ calls each of us into Christian friendship. I don't really think it's optional, but I definitely think we treat it as such. But if we read John's gospel and we take it seriously, you go from disciple to friend. That's the the rubric. That's the paradigm. We're being called by God into this intimacy with one another. Jesus' disciples, now friends, these people he is intentionally fostering and creating and calling to create new fellowships of believers who are embracing one another in this this unique experience of our humanity together. I think that this, this, this image of John the way he writes this intimacy with God, this intimacy with one another, it makes it clear that church, friends, and and friends being a part of your church, it shouldn't just be a lucky byproduct for some people who just happen to connect with some people at church on a deeper level. No, I I think it's a pivotal part of what it means to be the church. The Johannine community, they were 
wedded together. They were knit deeply, probably because this was their gospel. This was the one they read. This is the one that they patterned their following of the Christ after. In John's gospel, it highlights intimacy with God on this planet, on this earth, in this life, and intimacy with those who we are on the journey with. But man, our world today, it, we, we're terrible at friendship in the world today. I mean, most of us weren't given good examples of this growing up. We weren't really taught how to do it. Many of our parents didn't necessarily have close friends. And we live in the world of acquaintances and shallow interactions. We live in a world of walls and guardedness. We live in a world where we keep people at arm's distance. And I don't know about you, but like this whole keeping people six feet away thing, it's weird. But it occurred to me, like for a lot of people, it's not that different than normal. A lot of people stay six feet away. We live in a world that doesn't understand friendship, that hasn't had good examples of it. And the church is not really, I don't think, a whole lot better. And I think that this is where our text at the end comes in because it talks about fear as the uh, enemy of love. Fear is what gets in the way of love. And love is what makes a friendship real and deep and authentic. Friendships, they take a lot of effort and intention. And if we never call or text or write, that relationship's probably not going to go anywhere or stay healthy for very long. Any relationship takes work, it takes intention. I don't care if it's your marriage, if it's your relationship with your kids or your parents or your mom. Call your mom people after church today if you can. But human relationships require intention. In Jesus, in all four Gospels, he shows us that this intention also is required for our relationship with God. Sometimes people get frustrated because they say, I don't feel like God's communicating with me. And I've been there too. But one of the quickest questions I want to turn back on people is, how are you opening up the lines of communication with God? And a lot of times it's, you know, well, I I offered my prayer request last week. And the metaphor that comes to mind with this is if if you have a friend, and we've probably all been here at one time or another, but if you have a friend who you haven't called in months, and then you need something, right? And then you call that friend. It's not the best thing for the relationship long term. But a lot of times we don't apply that same mentality to God. But the Christian God is personal. The Christian God is a subjective, interacting being. And maybe we should be doing more than just petitioning God to give us what we want or what we need. Maybe we should just write God a thank you note for what we have. Just open up the lines of communication and see what comes from there. Intimacy requires communication. It requires intention. The same is true of friendships with one another, friends within the church, but we're afraid. First John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. I close with this thought. I am convinced that most people, even professing Christians in churches across our country, we're in desperate need of wallless, borderless, uninhibited, legitimate, authentic human connection with other siblings in Christ, and we're not sure how to get it. It hasn't been modeled for us. It doesn't get talked about enough. But John... John says, you just got to start somewhere. Open up the lines of communication. Reach out to somebody. And fear is going to be the thing that's going to keep you from doing it. But perfect love casts out fear. So the more that we choose to embrace love, the more that the fear will take a back seat. The friends within the Christian tribe, we need siblings who are friends, who just know it all, who just know us. There's no 
pretensions, there's no walls. People in, who, with whom we are completely vulnerable, we are completely open. We should not be afraid to tell someone in our faith community what's really going on because we're somehow afraid of what they might think or feel about us. They should be the, the people in your life that you can trust with anything. That's the church, my friends. The Gospel of John, the letters of John, they call, they call for a radical church that leans into one another, that leans into relationship with one another, that is willing to put ourselves out there, willing to get hurt by somebody who maybe doesn't want to be our friend, but we're called to work on it, we're called to try, because it's what Jesus did with his own disciples. Love really is the answer to our fear of one another, our fear of intimacy, our fear of depth, our fear of vulnerability. And John says, fear has to do with punishment. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. So friends, may we be a community at East Side who puts ourselves out there, who chooses love over fear, who recognizes we can't do this alone. We can't be Lone Ranger spirituality people. We can't be a part of a church and not really be known and know. It's not the way the Christ laid it out for us, and that's not the way the Johannine community lived. And we're called, we're called to know one another and to be in each other's lives. So, may it be so in the name of God, the Creator, God, the Redeemer, God, the Sustainer. And everyone typed, Amen. Well, my siblings in Christ, this is the time in our worship service where we respond to the word proclaimed by passing our digital offering baskets. Um, No, we obviously are not passing offering baskets in this season, and we have moved all of our giving, for the most part, online to our Give app. If you've not tried it yet, it is remarkably easy to use. You can download it on your smartphone or on your desktop in just a couple of minutes, and you can um, support the work of Eastside so quickly and so easily. And I just want to say thank you because so many people have like lived up to the challenge and have signed on for Give, and uh, a lot of people who are doing okay right now, um, even even in the midst of everything, have decided, have made the choice to be more generous in this season. And uh, I had a finance team meeting this week, and it was, you know, not the finance team meeting that I know that a lot of other churches are having right now. And I just want to say thank you to those of you who are doing okay and have just made that, made that decision to do above and beyond because you know that not everybody in our community is doing okay. And um, yeah, the budget's still there. We're still doing, we're still doing all the ministry. Um, we're just doing it differently. Uh, the staff are working hard, and we're trying to be there to support you all and to support one another in this season. And the budget's still there. So we do. We just invite you to, as you're able, to give. And if you're in a season of struggle and of trauma and of trial, A, please let us know so that we can be there for you, at least in relationship and in prayer. If something's going on, you please reach out to me or to any of the staff or to the care team. Um, Don't do that in silence. Um, But if you're struggling financially right now, as I know some of you are, don't feel compelled or pressured to give in this season. We have other folks that have chosen to give more, and that is just a beautiful thing as we seek to be the interdependent body of Christ at Eastside Church. Let me pray now and ask God to bless the gifts that are about to be given. God, we give you thanks for this church, for the generosity that is already present within Eastside and those who are doing all that they can to allow this church to not, not take a step back in this season, but to actually lean forward, to grow in this season, to become stronger in this strange, uh, strange season of this pandemic, God. We give you thanks that Eastside is leaning in and is doing more right now and May we continue, God, to grow and to do the work of your kingdom for one another and to do the work of your kingdom for this community and our world. Bless this church, God, mightily. Bless the gifts that are given, and may they go to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen.
Hi, my name is Brianna, and I'm a member here at Eastside Church. For the past three years, and now four, I have had the privilege of leading our Prayers of the People, our time of corporate prayer, on Mother's Day. And certainly this is a Mother's Day very different than many of us imagined. And so I think it's important we come before God, both in celebration and lament on this day. So Prayers of the People is going to look just a little different than our normal pattern this morning, but I invite you to participate, and when I say, Lord, in your mercy, respond with hear our prayers. Let us go before the Lord in prayer together. Lord, we come before you on a day marked for celebration of the love between mothers and children. But first, we must lament and cry out against the racism so persistent in this world. We pray this morning for Wanda Cooper, who on Mother's Day is mourning the loss of her son, Ahmaud Arbery. We pray for the many mothers of color whose children have been taken from them because of racism. We pray for mothers who live in daily fear that their children could face the same. We pray for transformation and justice. We confess and we lament our own apathy, ignorance, and inaction the ways we knowingly and unknowingly allow racism to persist in this nation. Lord, change us. Lord, heal us. May we work endlessly until this country is a place where black mothers do not have to live in fear for the lives of their children, and black bodies are not subject to violence, trauma, and death. Lord, in your mercy. Friends, we are going to take a moment now, rather than at the end of prayer, for silent confession. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed motherhood and parenting for most. Lord, we pray for mothers who find themselves loving and caring for children in a situation they never imagined. We pray for energy and resources for mothers who have lost their villages and support systems that make caring for their children possible. We pray for protection and strength for mothers who are parenting in abusive and toxic households. We pray for mothers who find themselves as full-time teachers, often while managing a career from home. Give them patience, rest, and wisdom. We pray for mothers who leave their children for jobs and essential services, like food service and health care, whose choice to come home and hug their children comes at a risk. Give them peace and endurance. We pray for mothers and children who are separated right now, missing milestones and moments together. Give them comfort. We pray for mothers who do not know how they will provide for their children in the current economic conditions, provide protection and resources. We pray for mothers whose children are particularly vulnerable at this time, those with compromised immune systems, medical needs, and disabilities. Bring them support and fill them with courage. We pray for mothers who have lost children due to this disease, as well as others and for those who are mourning the loss of their mother today. Today, may you bring memories of love and joy. May they feel your love as they grieve. Lord, in your mercy. Let us, as mothers, give grace to ourselves and one another. Lord, may we celebrate the small wins and focus on the goal of coming out of this pandemic whole. May we find ways to demonstrate our love and your love to our children. Let us be quick to laugh and forgive and willing to ask for help and forgiveness when we need it. Let us mother in ways that create a more equitable world. May we parent our children in a way that not only benefits them, but brings about a better world for all. Motherhood is kingdom work. And in the mundane tasks of dishes, bath, laundry, stories, and endless question and answer sessions, let us remember that you are allowing us to help shape the future. 
Let us sit in the seriousness and awe that this truth deserves. Let us rejoice that you see women fit for such a task in the many ways women mother the children of this world. As biological, adoptive, and foster moms, godmothers, grandmas, aunts, and friends, and all the way mothering occurs without a formal title. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in the heaviness of this time, we are also reminded that the pain and exhaustion we sometimes feel as mothers is only possible because of the strength and fierceness of a mother's love. Motherhood is a reminder of the goodness in a broken world. When we feel empty, let us find more love and strength in you. Let us find new and creative ways to be in community with one another and love and shape the children you have entrusted to us. So Lord, we come to you with all we have in us, our exhaustion and frustrations in parenting during COVID, our mourning and sadness for mothers who are overwhelmed with pain today and affected by injustice, our anger for mothers who need justice, and our joy for the love and laughter of our children. We can be all these things, and you are big enough for all of it. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. So friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God and amen. And now, feel free to pass the peace with those who are at, with you at your home, as well as by sharing a message on social media. we celebrate Holy Communion together. But right now, due to the pandemic, we can't all be together. Right now, loving each other and loving our neighbors means staying home and staying safe. So instead, as we've done for the last few weeks, we are going to have a love feast. You can join us by finding something to eat, like a cracker, a small piece of bread, and something to drink. Ready, Sayla? One of our favorite things about Communion at Eastside is that the kids always join us, so my kids are joining me today. All right, everybody, if you take a cracker. You get a cracker? Crackers. Okay, wait. Wait. No, I got one. Okay, here. And wait, hold it in your hand. And then we're using some raspberry lemonade. You guys can each grab. Okay. As you drink and eat this, remember that God loves you, and remember that you are part of the East Side community. Good morning, church. My name is Katie, and I'm on staff here at Eastside. If you don't currently receive our weekly newsletter and would like to, you can subscribe on our website at eastsideatl.org to get all of our announcements. Please fill out our digital connection card to let us know you're worshiping with us this morning, 
or whenever you watch our video stream this week. This connection form is pinned in our Facebook comment thread right now and linked on our digital live stream page on our website. This connection card also has space for your prayer requests. Thank you again for continuing your tithes and gifts to Eastside. Our missions, congregational care, youth, and children's ministries are able to continue to serve digitally because of your generosity. The best way to give is through the Give, G-Y-V-E, app, which can be accessed through our website. In March, Eastside had planned a screening of the HBO documentary, True Justice, with a discussion planned afterwards. This event was canceled as Eastside adopted social distancing. In light of ongoing guidance around avoiding in-person events, and in light of the continuing racial injustice occurring in our country and our state, we have started working towards plans for rescheduling a digital screening and discussion of our panel event. Please keep an eye out for more information as this digital event plan comes together. Pastor Tim is offering weekly appointments for pastoral counseling and to touch base and connect. Tim would love a chance to have a conversation with you either over Zoom or with a phone call. Uh, you can sign up um, with him on our Calendly, uh, on his Calendly schedule, um, which is linked in our Facebook uh, group. Eastside will continue to worship digitally and participate in digital community according to the most recent guidelines of the North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Church. Please keep up to date with us on our plans as we move forward. Sorry, things got out of order. <laughs> um, one of our mission partners, East Atlanta Kids Club, has sent us a recent update um, that they are delivering more than 2,400 pounds of food every week um, to households in need, including to our partner uh, organization, Brandon Towers. Um, if you would like to figure out a way to serve with them, you can contact them directly on their website or their Instagram page, um, and Eastside is continuing to support that ministry here in our community. Um, we also are in need of food for our pantry here on site. Um, you can drop food off anytime at our pantry, or you can contact me, Katie, at eastsideatl.org to um, figure out a time to drop off more of a bulk donation uh, so that we can uh, stock the pantry with those items. Uh, youth group is continuing to meet on Wednesday evenings. If you have a youth that would like to participate, participate, please contact Karina for more information on that. Um, our weekly kids collective time uh, is posted each week on our Facebook, um, Instagram, and newsletter. And you can subscribe to Roxy's YouTube page for all of our kids ministry videos from the past. <laughs> Eastside is working towards uh, providing a virtual camp creation this summer. If you or your child has an interest in recording a teaching craft for that, please let Roxy know. And core groups are finishing up this month for the semester. Um, if your core group is, um, is planning a um, end of semester celebration um, or game night, um, we hope that y'all enjoy um, finishing up this uh, semester in, in community together. Um, and please stay tuned for details about summer community and study opportunities that will be coming in the coming weeks. Um, and last but not least, we have our weekly game night on Tuesday night from 8.30 to 9.30. We would love for you to join us in our Zoom game room there, um, which will be linked through our Facebook and Instagram account. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Well, happy Mother's Day, church. Um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to uh, worship digitally together again. Uh, and as we come to close, I want to invite you to sing with me uh, the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Oh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on the earth as it is in heaven. on the earth as it is in heaven oh give all the world her daily bread and forgive
forgive us all for our sin and help us forgive all those who've wronged us while keeping our hearts far from temptation and oh keep our hearts far from temptation reflecting recently, asking uh, what are some of the things that people are, f- are feeling like they're longing for or missing in this season of COVID when it comes to Eastside, when it comes to worship. And two things kind of came up um, as we were having this conversation recently. One of those being we miss Holy Communion. We miss the Eucharist, the body and the blood of Christ. We miss sharing in that sacrament together as a community. And the other piece that we talked about was uh, we've missed just more of the liturgical elements that are part of our regular worship because uh, the the Eucharist celebration is a very liturgical act and not having that celebration um, takes away a lot of what what is familiar for many of us and and, and, and something that feeds and nourishes us coming in week and week out and, and being fed by that. So we're, we're, we're experimenting with a few different ways to bring in um, some, some more liturgy into our worship gatherings. And obviously the love feasts are, are an attempt of ours to to supply some of that, that intimacy that we receive with Holy Communion, even though it's different. Um, so we've been re- reworking a little bit of the, the communion liturgy, and we're going to be trying to place it in some of the different parts of our worship service to bring some of that familiarity in in a different way. And this morning, I'm going to invite us to not, not offer the closing prayer for the great Thanksgiving, but a similar prayer, but that, that, that invites the whole of our worship gathering in um, as we are the body of Christ going out into the world. So I invite you, wherever you may find yourself this morning, to pray with me in this closing prayer. Eternal God, We give you thanks for the holy mystery that is your church scattered across your precious planet. We are grateful that you have once again met us in this time of worship and prayer and filled us to overflowing. Reassure us, O God, that right now we are your living presence, the body of Christ. Thank you for filling and empowering us anew, your church, with an inextinguishable strength to be your hands and feet for our fellow humans. In this season where the universal Christian community yearns to break the bread and pour the cup to share in holy communion, remind us afresh that on this day, we are holy communion for our world. We are the mystical hands, feet, body, and blood of the Christ wherever we find ourselves. Empower us, O God, to pour ourselves out 
for the good of our fellow humans, for this world you so desperately love. Grant that we may return to the world changed, empowered, and enlivened anew by the infinite strength of your eternal spirit. As Christ has done for us, may we pour ourselves out for the redemption, resurrection, and transformation of this hurting planet. All of this we pray in the name of God the Creator, our indelibly loving parent, God our Redeemer, Jesus the Christ our Lord, and God the Sustainer, your life-giving Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen, friends. In the name of the Holy God, Father, Son, Spirit, Sustainer, Redeemer, Creator, go in peace, friends, and be be the friends and the friend that our world desperately needs us to be in this in this season. Amen. Amen. See you next week, y'all.